Yes, good afternoon everyone. It's Ken Murphy from GP Connections and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, we do have some other people that have uh, are joining us. There's been a few technical problems, but uh, uh, to be fair for everyone else, we'll uh, we'll get it uh, get it going. Um, just like to welcome today's presenters, uh, Elizabeth O'Connor, a physiotherapist, and Jane Hawkless, occupational therapist, who are going to give us uh, the latest evidence in neurological rehabilitation. Just a reminder to everyone, down the bottom left hand part of your screen is a uh, little white On to the next slide. Treadmill training, cognitive rehabilitation and management of hypertonicity. I'll be talking through the first two topics and Jane will be joining for the second two. So today we wanted to present some of the latest evidence behind neurological rehabilitation but also um, let you know when your patients might actually benefit from occupational therapy or physiotherapy intervention. So when we get a new referral, we'd like to have definite goals and for the person to have a, to have potential for rehab. Um, and this obviously Okay, so I'm Libby O'Connor and I've got Jane with me. Between us we've got over fifteen years experience working in rehabilitation in a variety of settings. Jane um, has been most recently an advanced occupational therapist at Toowoomba Base Hospital and in this role she contributed to the development of the subacute model of care and the acute stroke service. Um, CAD generally, there's two main schools of thought. Um, there are others and the OTs in some cases tend to be a little bit more eclectic than we are. Um, but there's the neurosciences approach um, that came out of Sydney and the Bobas concept that was developed in England by the Bobas in the polar epidemic. It has moved forwards with the advances in neurological, neuro, neurophysiology and neuroanatomy that have been developed. Um, however, regardless of which um, type of approach you use, the role of rehab is to drive and facilitate neuroplasticity. Um, and to reduce any sensory secondary impairments that may occur. So the neurosciences approach is very um, basically repetitive, task specific and intensive. So it's about practicing a functional task over and over and over again um, and breaking down that task into little pieces and practicing that over again. Um, it's based on the um, background that neuroplasticity requires um, thousands of repetitions for those connections to be made in the brain. The BOBUS concept is more about alignment and selectivity of movement. So it looks at how normals function and then tries to get a person that's been affected by a neurological condition to get as close to normal as possible and to feed back into the central nervous system um, to try and get things like central pattern generators that I'll talk about a little later and the cerebellum involved because often in, in a cortical stroke they're not affected and we should be able to walk using those things provided we don't have too many um, secondary impairments going on. It is very hands-on and uses a lot of facilitation to drive the plasticity. Um, a lot of the latest research um, that exists in the rehabilitation field um, is centered around the constraint-induced movement therapy. So this is specifically for the upper limb where they tend to constrain the unaffected arm while they um, intensively train the affected arm to take over some functional tasks. It requires a minimal degree of movement in the affected arm to be effective. Um, a lot of the research is with really intensive programs that sometimes cannot often be used in hospitals or definitely in the community and it is, as you can imagine, incredibly frustrating for the patient so um, you've sort of got to pick your clientele. 
I'm going to talk a little bit more about treadmill training. Dual task performance is um, one thing that's been a little bit neglected in that we try and teach patients to walk again, but um, often when normals are walking, um, we're thinking about what we're going to cook for dinner, um, we're talking on the phone, we might be um, negotiating stairs or something that's slightly unusual and that seems to be something that we've neglected over um, recent years and something that rehab is focusing on now. Um, repetitive task specific training we've touched on. FES is functional electrical stimulation and this is um, an electrical current delivered to the muscles to stimulate a muscle contraction. Um, it is used, say for example, in to prevent subluxation follow, following stroke and also falls and balance interventions. Now, if, um, if you'd like more information about any of those, I think Jane and I would be happy to come back and give um, another talk at some stage. So obviously the stroke guidelines were developed and these are the, um, I guess the, the um, type of activities that we should be using with our clients that have um, research behind them. So I'll talk a little bit about cardiovascular endurance. So cardiovascular fitness is the ability to perform large muscle dynamic moderate to high intensity exercise for prolonged periods and low levels of cardiovascular fitness are associated with a markedly increased risk of premature death. So stroke rarely occurs in isolation as you would know. Um, it was thought that recovery was exclusively dependent on the neuromuscular system. However, if we do look at the cardiovascular system as well, um, we probably could get further improvement in their function. Um, this is quite a startling figure that less than one third of the variance in disability after stroke um, can be determined by the extent of the neurological damage. So obviously, I mean all of us after an illness will expense will experience a deterioration in fitness um, and this is something that's often not addressed following stroke and if we do address cardiovascular fitness without even addressing the neuromuscular aspects we should be able to get some improvement in function. Okay. This, is, this was a cross-sectional observational study examining free living physical ability of ambulatory community dwelling people with stroke as compared to age match controls. They used a IDEA which was an intelligent device for energy expenditure and activity. It was worn for two days a week for most of the day that the patient was active. They were all over 50 years and were one to five years after their first stroke and retired. Another, um, all of them had to be able to walk 10 metres independently. Um, so you can see that um, the stroke survivors um, are not um, as active as their healthy age counterparts. They spend less time on their feet. Um, I guess this comes about as, um, say if something's upstairs that you might need, um, if you're not that um, motivated or mobile, you'll just think I can manage without it, whereas if you're quite fit and active, you'd, you'd go up and, and, and get whatever you needed. Also some of this could be explained by the slowness that stroke patients have following their stroke. It's also noted that um, stroke patients walk considerably less than their the recommended uh, um, 10,000 steps per day and strokes survivors walk only 60 to 70 percent of healthy elderly walking speed. The other thing that, and this is an old study, but um, we, we looked at this in some of the clinics where we um, fit devices or orthoses to people to look at the energy expenditure of walking and a stroke patient for them to walk their energy expense expenditure is considerably greater and obviously this only compounds the problem. Um, these sequelae of stroke, um, I, I think that's no surprise to anyone that some of the patients experience this and if we do get them more active and start them on an exercise program hopefully we can help some of those. Um, just another consideration, so we said earlier that stroke patients walk considerably slower than their healthy um, age match controls but 
um, and I couldn't find the Australian figures either actually, the English figures, but to get on a, a green person to cross at lights, um, the time allowed for that before the red flashing man starts is it, the people have got to walk 1.2 metres per second, which is normal for healthy elderly. However, on average stroke patients walk considerably slower and technically cannot get across a street in the time required. So this is just one of the problems that may happen um, because stroke patients aren't as active and obviously there's the problems with social isolation. So just some of the studies that looked at the high intensity exercises. Um, the um, exercise group that had progressive resistance training and cycling showed significant improvement in muscle strength and power. Um, so it has been found that we can actually train stroke survivors. Um, and if they obviously spend as much time being physically active as their controls, um, hopefully their risk factors would decrease. So therefore rehabilitation and community programs that target improvements in movement speed are most likely to have the best impact on improving physical disability after stroke. So where we target our programs are to work on the large muscle groups, it needs to be 20 to 30 minutes of moderate intensity three to five times a week. And I always like them, the patients to be screened by doctors prior to commencing the exercise. And obviously given these people's um, disabilities and limitations, the fact that the exercise is individualised is utmost importance, especially initially. The stroke guidelines um, actually state that six months after stroke, people should have access to in interventions to improve their fitness and mobility. Um, just a little word about the Change Project, which is run by the Regional Council to promote um, fit and healthy changes. There's three programs there, um, and they're $3 for certain groups within the community, um, including part-time workers, pensioners, etc. But go on their website to find out a little bit more about them. They are run by either exercise physiologists or personal trainers. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about treadmill training. So with the um, patients with a neurological condition, um, we just use a normal treadmill. It does have to go fairly slow, so that's one thing we look at, but most treadmills, normal treadmills are fine. With treadmill training with partial body weight support, there's actually a harness the patient wears. Um, the benefits of the harness is for safety, but also to remove some of the weight. So if we're not weighting the weak muscles as much, hopefully they'll be more effective. And as the patient gets stronger, we slowly increase the weight that the patient takes. So treadmill training allows earlier and more specific training. Obviously, it's task-specific track practice because a lot of people focus on walking post-stroke, so they're actually practicing walking. Um, because the it's easier for the therapist to facilitate people walking because you're not trying to roll around on the floor or crawl around on the floor assisting with movement. You can actually minimise adaptive movements. They can walk further and faster. It is based on the force use um, concept. Obviously, if you're walking, you're forced to use your affected leg and also keys into more automatic components of walking. Um, along with the... Um, with that automaticity of walking, it can key into your central pattern generators. Now, central pattern generators are networks of neurons in the spinal cord, and they generate rhythmical motor activity in gait in the absence of sensory input from the periphery. So your central pattern generators can actually work without cortical control. Um, so you, in, in a real life situation, um, you may remember, and I, I found one, one um, marathon in 1984 in Los Angeles where the, patient, the participants kept running after the marathon had finished and that was because the central pattern generators were basically walk, working without cortical control. They just keep going and going and going until your cortex tells them to stop. So with treadmill training we um, think that we're keying into the central pattern generators which should be able to work without the cortex, which has been damaged in the stroke, and also keys into the cerebellum as well, which um, should be able to work without cortical drive. One other advantage of treadmill training is um, it's found that in order to swing the leg through, 
um, at terminal stance. Um, if you get your hip into enough hip extension, you actually get a quick stretch to your ipsilateral hip flexors, which will in turn help the leg swing through. However, most stroke patients, when they're retraining to walk, specifically if they're using a walking frame and sometimes parallel bars, their hip is never getting into enough extension to allow that quick stretch to the hip flexors to swing the leg through. And obviously in the treadmill you can get them far more upright in normal alignment within gravity to try and get those normal mechanisms going. So when you look at training specifically central pattern generators, they will only turn on at a specific speed um, after a period of walking. You need to be weight bearing and obviously there does need to be some input um, going into them. Um, so treadmill training is proven to be effective in all of these conditions. I haven't listed all the studies there, but hemiplegia including brain injury, um, spinal cord injury, cerebral palsy, Parkinson's disease and community people um, following stroke. And all these studies were undertaken when rehab was completed. So just looking at one trial, of which there are many, um, this trial was a randomised trial. It looked at 126 stroke patients unable to walk within four weeks of stroke. The experimental group walked for 30 minutes per day um, with treadmill training with partial body weight support. The control group walked for 30 minutes a day using the more conventional overground walking. The outcome they looked at was the percentage of patients achieving independent walking within six months. Now they found at one month, 40% of the experimental group were walking as opposed to the independent group and that was significant. Um, and by six months, 71% of the experimental group were walking as compared to 59%. Um, so obviously they, with partial weight, on a treadmill, they're walking sooner, which um, everyone is aware of the pressures in rehab units these days, so the, the faster we can get them walking, um, the, the better for the patient because we don't have long in that rehab environment. Um, and, this, and, and the hypothesis was that because within the week one, the experimental group walked 129 metres versus 26 metres with the overground walking group, and that could also be seen in the week before walking was achieved, that they're just getting a lot more practice. So it improves, improves gait symmetry, gait capacity, gait speed, and it is, you can facilitate a more normal gait pattern, which has to be better for the patient. Some other benefits is that it's incredibly safe because the patients are using the harness, and if they do fall, the harness will catch them. Um, the ergonomics of the therapist, so we're not, like I said, crawling around on the floor. However, it is quite intense um, because you need someone to operate the treadmill. Often someone might need to um, just initially facilitate some weight shift and then often you need to swing the hemiplegic leg through initially and it's quite a work workout, but as the patients progress through the program they get more and more independent and actually can become independent in practice because the harness is there. The harness can also be used for other activities and can also be used down a hallway. So often I will get them walking in a treadmill, take them off and then get them to walk still in the harness but to practice what we've just learnt in quite safe. But you can also do kitchen assessments and that sort of thing with the harness on and the patients are completely safe if they fall over. So just in summary, treadmill training with or without um, body weight support has shown to be an effective modality to retrain gait in a variety of conditions at various stages of recovery, recovery and there appears to be no negative impacts of treadmill training. Okay, I'll hand you over to Jane now who will um, continue to talk about cognitive rehabilitation and hypertonicity management. Okay, great. Thanks, Lib. Um, so I'm going to talk about cognitive rehabilitation. So just before I start, um, just to preface it with, in, when I'm talking in terms of cognitive rehabilitation, what I've looked at in terms of the literature is just purely cognition. So haven't looked at those perceptual skills like neglect, apraxia, those kinds of things. Um, and for the purposes of today, have also limited it to um, the diagnostic groups of brain injury, so stroke and TBI, um, multiple sclerosis, so MS and Parkinson's disease. Um, so I have, just for the purpose of today, have tried to make it um, a little bit finite. 
Um, so, in terms of the types of cognitive impairment we see with these diagnostic groups, um, there tends to be a lot of overlap with them. So, we're seeing primarily um, in that acquired brain injury, um, attention deficits, memory deficits and executive func function deficits. In terms of the prevalence or incidence for these cognitive deficits, it does it is dependent on the site of the injury um, and you do tend to see it more in um, cortical strokes and one of the, uh, that can be around that 75%. Subcortical tends to be less than 50%. Um, MS, it, what we tend to see a lot with MS patients is those memory deficits. Um, so that can include that short term memory um, and that for some reason tends to be more verbal memory than visual memory, um, also executive function and also what we see with MS clients is that information processing speed as well. In terms of incidence for cognitive impairment in MS, it, the literature range um, and range between 40% and 70%. One of the articles I read, which and I found this quite interesting, was that um, it looked at neurologists who suspected MS patients who did have a cognitive impairment, they were right 90% of the time, for, and neurologists who, who suspected they didn't have a cognitive impairment, they were wrong 50% of the time. And I just think that's interesting to note in terms of it's really easy to see a physical impairment. It's easy to see um, an, an afunctional arm or someone having walking difficulties, but those cognitive impairments can be a lot harder to, to detect and to see. Um, and people can present quite well um, in a conversational sense on face value, but it's, it's much harder to see those executive function difficulties or those memory difficulties. And they're the things that can have big functional implications for clients um, and, and then those flow on effects for their carers as well. Um, and Parkinson's disease is another thing that you know, I guess we often think of it in terms of a, a motor um, condition but there's also non-motor features of it as well. And again, it tends to be those memory and executive function that um, we tend to see and that could, the instance of that can be from 21 to 55 percent depending on the study that you look at. Um, so this is just a really simplistic um, diagram of how we currently manage cognitive dysfunction. So I guess there's two schools of thought. You can compensate for it or you can try and restore, restore it or remediate it. Um, and so that restoration is really about trying to work on that skill and try and improve that skill whereas compensation is really about look, we're not going to fix it, what can we do to make this personal person functional? Um, they, they don't necessarily operate in isolation, um, you can do them simultaneously and that's going to be dependent on the client you're working with, their goals and their comorbidities and their general presentation. So when we talk in terms of compensatory strategies or compensatory interventions, um, I guess we're talking in terms of external strategies and internal strategies. So those external strategies are really um, things you can set up in the environment to compensate for those deficits. Um, in some ways we're really fortunate that we live in the technological age that we do now um, and there's a lot of external strategies around. So particularly for memory deficits, um, smartphones and iPads and things like that, the apps associated with that have been fantastic from a memory population. Um, obviously you have to be selective with the person you're using that with um, and um, they tend to work really well with the younger clientele um, and, and not to say that they don't work well with the older clientele, there's some really technologically savvy um, older people um, but you just have to make sure it's the right strategy. Um, then there's the low tech um, applications as well, so just think simple things like calendars or notebooks in their pocket or those kinds of things um, and also looking at how you can set up their environment, so for people with attentional deficit, um, it can be um, you know, earplugs when they're going into an environment um, or, or going to the restaurant when it's not peak hour or to the shops or things like that. So it's just strategies like that. Um, you can then look at internal strategies as well. So and these are, and these are things, these are a ways for people to um, to compensate basically. So again, for memory, a really common one is rehearsal. So teaching a person to say the information over and over in their head so they're laying it down so they can try and retain that information. Um, 
also trying to get an association with that information with something. So whether that be a mental image, so you know if they're trying to remember someone's name, trying to come up with some visual um, visual image that they then remember in their head, and trying to make that as extreme and as nuts and crazy as it can be, because then it's more likely to be remembered. Or motor movements, and I think a really good one for this, a good example of this, is when you're trying to remember a phone number, actually typing it on the keypads. And, and so you've got that kinesthetic motor movement associated with the actual numbers. Um, there's also task specific training. So Lib touched on this before, but in terms of compensatory strategies for cognition, it's really how you set up that task or set up that up in, set up that environment for a specific task. So then this relates back to your goal setting. What are the things that the person wants to be able to do? Set up set up the task so they can do that independently. And so again, that may be um, visual cues on the wall, it may be picture sequences, um, it may be a timer, setting up a timer so they know when to move to the next step or to remind themselves to go back and um, to check that they've turned the oven off when they leave the house or things like that. Um, there's also the concept of internal cueing. Um, and so that's basically trying to set up an internal dialogue for people um, that they can then use in situations. So an example of that is, um, so on the right are some um, internal dialogues for people with attention difficulties. So getting them to, you know, to think about, I need to, this person is talking to me, I need to look at their eyes and concentrate on what they're saying. And I guess with these strategies, what we're trying to achieve is we start external, we grade it until it becomes internal, and then what we're looking for long term is for it to become automatic. Um, the, the diagram on the left is a problem solving. So it's, it's similar to that stop, think, do. So stop, think about the situation, plan some possible strategies, act on that. Um, and again, you start external, you start that with worksheets with patients, you help them brainstorm it, and then you decrease the amount of um, assistance you're giving them with that. Remediation, on the other hand, is trying to work on the specific skill and doing drills and activities around that. Again, with technology at the moment, the apps, the computer programs, computer assisted programs that you can do for that kind of stuff is, is great. Um, but there's still the old fashioned pen and paper tasks as well. So again, it's um, working on working on that skill, um, and so it may be a worksheet, a problem-solving worksheet where they have a problem and they need to formulate it. So, and again, what the, the school of thought here is that that working on that splinter skill will translate to um, improve, will generalise to, fun to functional improvements. Um, in terms of the mechanisms for change around this remediation restoration, there's there hasn't been a lot in terms of how that occurs. So there's starting to be some functional MRI studies along with it and they are starting to show that with that remediation that there is starting to be um, other regions of the cortex that then pick up that. So there is that neuroplasticity and that capacity for relearning. Um, what what hasn't been looked at well and I hope will be in the future is that intensity of it. So the research that's been done to date has really been about the, the actual treatments and not necessarily about the time frames for doing it. And I think when we're looking in terms of this remediation and restoration, we do need to be considerate of that intensity of practice and how much they are practicing that skill because I think that's really going to give us information about um, making those cortical changes. Okay, so what does the evidence tell us? Um, so first we're looking at progressive diseases. I guess the challenge with progressive diseases is, is how do you measure success? Um, so, you know, how do you, if it's a progressive disease, how do you know, like is success that you've, there's been a stability and there's been no change or you've slowed the decline? And how do you know if you've slowed the decline if you don't know how much they were going to decline in the first place? So I think because of that, there hasn't been a lot of research in this, in this area, um, but I think with, current advances and uh, we're seeing more of this population, there is starting to be some studies around it. Um, so what does it show us? So from a Parkinson's disease perspective, um, there hasn't been many studies and the studies that have been done have been small, small sample sizes and they haven't been overly robust design. Um, but having said that, the research to date is promising. So what has been done, they are starting to show that there is efficacy in cognitive rehabilitation for Parkinson's disease. 
And the other interesting thing that it has showed is that um, the interventions for that have been shown to be effective for CVA and TBI, which does have a bigger, stronger, a bigger evidence base, which we'll talk about in a sec, they strongly align with the evidence for Parkinson's disease and for MS as well. So, what, so I guess what they're saying is they're making this leap that, okay, well, if it works with this client group, this similar client group of CVA and TBI, then we can extra extrapolate that the same things may work for the progressive neurological conditions as well. Um, and so MS is a fairly similar story. So not a huge body of evidence, small sample sizes, poor research design, um, but there is some emerging evidence. Um, what there is stronger evidence for is for the use of cognitive rehabilitation for that for memory. Um, so memory span, working memory, and immediate visual memory. Um, so then looking at brain injury, there is more evidence around. So there's been um, quite a few Cochrane reviews done, there's the National Stroke Guidelines, the evidence-based review of the stroke rehab um, have done some meta-analyses and there's also the Canadian Stroke Engine. So we've got a bigger evidence base to draw from and draw conclusions from. Um, so in terms of attention, the, the main finding is um, the main findings is that there's moderate assistance for the computer-assisted training. So thinking back to that compensation remediation, the computer-assisted training is really um, that remediation um, concept. Um, there's limited, limited evidence for an attention process training, and so it's, it's a specific package um, that you can buy, um, and again, it's computer-based. Um, and so I think for those two points, the important thing to, um, to remember with those is that they are intensive programs. So again, and relating back to that CIMT stuff, that intensity of practice stuff, um, they're cognitive programs that you do do a lot of work on. So you're hammering that skill and you're practicing that skill continuously. So I guess the reason I say that is, is it really about those programs per se or is it about the, the time that you're practicing those skills and that's what contributes to that, that cognitive improvement. Um, in general terms, though, there's been limited evidence for cognitive rehab, um, and so, like I said, there's been there was a Cochrane review done in 2008, um, and there was also a systematic review done of uh, sorry, meta-analysis done of two systematic reviews, and so that was the finding from that. But again, um, whilst it wasn't um, conclusive, it was promising. So what it was showing was positive effects. Um, the one thing that there was evidence for was um, work for divided attention or that dual, dual task training and that seems to be where the strongest evidence is. Um, and so Lib talked about that before as well and so that's a really functional thing as well. Uh, unfortunately what it did show was that um, there were sustained effects, in the, so there were effects in the short term but they weren't sustained to the long term. Uh, and so what the authors though argued is that that's not necessarily a bad thing. That can be okay from a rehab point of view. So if you can work on that in the short term and you're getting those short term gains, that is potentially going to translate to improvements in other areas from a rehab perspective. Um, looking at it from a memory perspective, there is more evidence around for that. So where the strongest evidence is, is for those compensatory strategies um, and then there's moderate evidence for the um, computer-based training. So the evidence is saying compensate, use those external and internal strategies to compensate. Executive dysfunction, and so when we were talking in terms of executive dysfunction, that's, you know, that's traditionally that frontal frontal lobe behaviours, um, you know, insight, problem solving, you know, high cortical level um, skills. Um, not a lot for it in terms of cognitive rehab for executive function. Um, however, what it did say is that there's strong evidence for that mental imagery um, and for that actual practice. So again, having that task specific training, that really functional approach to executive function. Um, and what it also did find, um, and this isn't my area but I, I just think it's interesting, that there's moderate evidence for music listening therapy for left hemisphere stroke. 
Um, so the take home messages for, for, from a cognitive rehab perspective is that it's an, it's an emerging evidence base and I hope in the next few years there'll be more evidence come out and there's more evidence for it in terms of those static brain injuries as opposed to those progressive diseases but we may be able to um, generalise from that brain injury to those progressive diseases. The strongest evidence is for, that comp for those compensatory strategies and for that functional approach and from a clinical perspective that's definitely what I see in terms of my, from my clinical experience. I think those cognitive processes, particularly our executive function, is such a complicated skill, um, it is really hard to remediate that and that compensatory approach does tend to be more successful. Um, and I guess the other point is that there is a high prevalence of it in this population um, and it can go undetected. Um, and so I think if in doubt, refer or do an MMSC or do a, you know, a mocker or something like that. And I think that can be a really enlightening experience for health professionals, um, but also for families as well. I think sometimes to see families, um, to see a significant other, see their um, partner or their dad or whatever, try to answer some of these questions, that, that can be a real eye opener for them. Um, so finally, just looking at management of hypertidicity. Um, so this is a really common picture we see for um, patients post-stroke, post-TBI, um, even in the MS population. So that flexor synergy pattern where they're holding their limb at rest like that. Um, so in, I guess when we talk about in terms of hypertrophy, what, what we really, like a, a really simplistic definition is an increased resistance to movement. Um, and so then from a therapy perspective, we tend to talk in terms of positive symptoms and negative symptoms. So the positive symptoms are what there's more of or what there's lots of. Um, so there's an ex excess or exaggerated movements and muscle overactivity. So quite often we see that spasticity, which is um, that overexcitability stretch um, reflex um, and the, over the overfiring of the alpha motor neurons. Um, and so, and then we also see those hyper, um, reactive reflexes, so clonus and the brisk tendon reflexes. You also see the, that dystonia kind of patterning, so that, ryth, um, that rhythmic movement um, and co-contraction, which is the contraction of the agonist and the antagonist simultaneously and tends, we tend to see that with voluntary movement, so not necessarily at rest. Um, then, then we also start to see some of these negative symptoms um, as a result of those positive symptoms. So um, that weakness and fatigue, um, and, uh, and I know that can be um, funny for people to think in terms of that, um, but we, particularly that weakness we see quite commonly when you do a Botox injection and you take away that spasticity, you are left with a very weak limb um, and people tend to, like people can use that spasticity quite effectively to, um, to move that limb, but the muscle itself is actually quite weak and so you actually do, you're losing motor units and that you, you um, there is that change in that muscle recruitment of muscle fibres as well. Um, it's also very fatiguing, like for, for a client f to move that limb with that spasticity and against that spasticity takes a lot of energy and effort, so they fatigue quite quickly. There's a slow movement initiation, again because there's that change in muscle recruitment, um, it, it, there, it is um, slow for people to instigate that movement, initiate that movement. Um, and also with that muscle imbalance between that agonist and antagonist, there's also that reduced dexterity. So that's not surprising when it's so hard for someone to move that limb that we then start to see that learned disuse. And the research is showing that it doesn't take long to get that learned disuse. Um, you know, and that's the whole um, CIMT stuff that Lib was talking about it feeds into um, trying to negate that. Um, we also start to see structural changes as well. So there's the stiffness and the weakness in the limbs. So there's the change in collagen production. Um, and in the joint capsule as well, so the stagnation of um, the synovial fluid. So there's all of these changes that are happening. Um, so then when you put that all together, it's not surprising that we see impairment in function as a result. Um, in terms of current management, um, from a therapy perspective, we tend to take that conservative management. So um, we're trying, a, a lot of it is based on upper limb, what, what, upper limb and lower limb retraining and trying to get some mobilisation of those limbs. Um, and trying to restore some um, muscle balance and, and retrain those muscle groups to work together basically. Um, 
stretches we'll talk about. It's still done as um, as a therapy intervention. Also strengthening, so that strengthening of the agonist and the antagonist. Um, electrical stimulation is being used a lot more in hypertensity management as well. Um, so as Lib talked about before, that um, stimulation to um, initiate a muscle contraction. Um, so it's used to assist with that strengthening, but then it's also used to try and inhibit that stretch reflex. So the theory is, is that if you um, if you stimulate and contract the antagonist, that will then um, in, inhibit that spasticity of the agonist. Um, and then there's also icing and tapping to facilitate muscle movement, so to facilitate um, muscle activity. Um, casting is quite a widely recognised treatment in terms of management of hypertensity. Um, and there's been some research, not in these populations, but in cerebral palsy, that actually shows that casting is as effective for um, to um, reduce spasticity as Botox. Um, so we can do casting can be done purely to as an inhib um, to inhibit that spasticity, or it can be con done in conjunction with Botox. Um, there's also lots of pharmacological interventions, and I'm not going to go into that because it's not my area. Um, but baclofen is something we, and the baclofen pump, um, probably not as prevalent as it used to be, um, but still around. Then there's also the injection of the phenol into the nerve, the surrounding nerve. Surgical interventions in terms of uh, tendon lengthening and tendon transfers when you start to get those contractions. Um, and botulinum toxin is also quite a widely recognised um, treatment technique. So what is the evidence telling us? Um, so first looking at stretching. So this incorporates um, passive, passive ranging um, as well as splinting and casting. So there was a big Cochrane review come out in 2011 by Catalinic and some of his colleagues that um, caused quite a bit of ruckus amongst the um, OT fraternity because what it basically showed, um, so it, it was 35 studies um, and did a meta-analysis of, of those and so that encapsulated um, 1,391 participants. Um, it did. It did include a large client base, so it included upper limb and lower limb. Also included neurological and non-neurological conditions. Um, so it was quite heterogene heterogeneous. Um, and then it looked at the immediate effect of stretch and also long-term effect of stretch up to six months. The upshot of the review was that it showed that there was a mean difference, uh, look, so in that long term up to six months, of three degrees improvement. Um, so in terms of is that clinically significant, is that worthwhile putting people, like it, we're talking a lot of resources, a lot of um, angst for patients as well to engage in this, um, is that three degrees clinically important or clinically relevant? relevant? Uh, that's, that's the big question at the moment. Um, so, basic, so as a flow and effect from that, what the, guide, the national stroke guidelines say, and what um, literature, um, what other practice guidelines are saying at the moment, is that splinting should not be routinely provided. However, that's not to say that we don't splint at all. Um, there are still cases where we can splint. There are still instances where we would splint, and there are still OTs that are splinting. Um, and um, and I guess in that there's. Whilst it showed the mean difference of three degrees, sometimes your goal is to maintain range. Um, and it may be that you would cast and then you would splint to maintain that range. And that is still a really realistic goal in terms of, if you think back to that picture with those you know, really flex kind of postures, we're then getting into hygiene issues in skin creases, in nails into palms, that can still be a real risk, really realistic goal. I think the other thing from, a clinical perspective is that people have seen casting be really effective and splinting being really effective. So uh, there is some hesitancy to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But this research is showing us that we, we shouldn't splint everyone and we really have to be really selective about who we are splinting and casting and doing stretch for. And just to get on my side box about stretching, um, I don't see, I think if you're going to do stretching with a client, we need to be encouraging some sort of active component to it. Um, I think passively stretching a limb doesn't, all it's really doing is mobilising the joint and getting some movement in that synovial fluid. I think what we need to be encouraging, and we want to encourage that cortical involvement. So if you are doing a stretch or if you are moving an arm, we need to be encouraging clients to be thinking about doing that movement and trying to get, you know, get some of that premotor cortex and that motor cortex activating as we're doing that stretch.
and, and so this is really only looking at passive stretching. And so that whole other active stretching is a whole other, a whole other um, ball game. Um, for Botox, lots of evidence for it. Um, so there's a strong evidence that it reduces spasticity, strong evidence that it reduces spasticity in conjunction with casting. And when I talk strong, strong evidence, this is like level 1A, 1B evidence. Um, strong evidence that it reduces spasticity in combination with therapy. Um, so then the stroke guidelines then go on to say that there's um, so level B evidence or level 2 evidence that um, it should be used in conjunction with rehab um, and that um, there should be some sort of goal setting alongside that. The last point is interesting in that there's conflicting evidence that it actually improves function. So I, I think what that is telling us is that the, the therapy itself reduces spasticity. The challenge is translating it to functional improvements. Um, and I think that's where that, um, that being used in conjunction with rehab and being used in conjunction with goals is really important. And I think so with this um, intervention, we need to be selective about who we are doing it with. Um, they, need to be, um, they need to have clear goals in terms of what they want to achieve um, and it needs to be the right clients as well. They need to be able to participate and they need to be able to therapy to, to get those sustained gains because essentially that Botox will, you know, um, inhibit that, that those alpha motor neurons for a period of time, but that will come back. It's not going to get rid of the spasticity. So that therapy afterwards is essential. Um, and to get those long-term gains, people need to be doing that therapy to get the gains to get that functional improvement. Um, in terms of just other treatments for hypertensity, so there's strong evidence for the use of the tilt table to prevent ankle contractures and there's moderate evidence for the use of electrical stimulation. So like we talked about before in terms of using that as a tool to facilitate muscle activation and strengthening but also um, to, uh, so it can be used for facilitation or inhibit uh, inhibiting um, and then so inhibiting um, that, that spasticity as well. Um, so in terms of the take-home messages, um, just to be aware that splinting isn't a routine intervention. Um, like I said, not to say that we don't do it, but we're just selective about who we do do it with. Um, and we need to consider that on an individual basis. And for us as therapists, the challenge is in maintaining those gains. And we need to take a multi-pronged approach. So therapists can't work in isolation to the neurologists or the rehab physicians um, and vice versa. We need to be working together as a team to be achieving the best outcomes. Um, so that's, that's our talk. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and I guess just also to say that we, the reason we chose those four topics is we obviously couldn't talk about everything and we felt that they were four topics that are very prevalent in the community population um, and we're more than happy, like Lib said, to come back and talk at a later date about some of the other therapy interventions. Um, and if anyone would like any more information or um, would like to refer to us, we've got a website that's up and live now. Um, and so it's www.nbtherapy, so n for neuro, b for bureau, therapy.com.au. Um, and so that's got all our contact details on it. Please feel free to call us if you want to talk about a client. Um, yeah, we're more than happy to help in whatever way we can. And that's us. Thank you. Yes, it's Ken Murphy from GP Connections again. Thank you very much. Uh, just a quick reminder, if you do have any questions, you can type in the bottom left-hand screen. There's a little chat box down there if anyone wants to uh, type any questions. Um, obviously, as always, uh, as always, if you do have any questions uh, that you think of after, um, you can uh, uh, certainly contact uh, contact the presenters through ourselves and uh, we'll certainly pass on the information. If there is no others, uh, just like to once again thank you very much to our presenters. Um, very well, very well presented and uh, very informative. Thank you.